Welcome everybody. It's time for Inside Hollywood and Behind the Book with your host, Hawk Koch. And uh, here's Freda Johnson. Hi guys. Hi, Jen. Hello there. Hi, Jen. Really Hi, glad Freda. to be back. Good to see you again, Hawk. It's been so long. And I haven't seen you since yesterday. You know. So I'm really excited about today. I mean, Sam is such a good friend of all of ours. This is his third time back. And what's so special about him is how he brings us a deeper understanding of filmmaking. So I'm excited to get to this. Um, just side note, I'm part of the cult of One from the Heart. So I hope there's a lot of discussion about that. And oh, uh oh. Now all right. to you. Well, uh, hi, everybody, and welcome. Uh, we are talking with best-selling author and my good friend, Sam Wasson. His new book, which has just come out recently, The Path to Paradise, a Francis Ford Coppola story. It charts the ins and outs, the ups and downs of a remarkable career, as well as speaks about the divergent paths of he and his co-founder of Zoetrope, a guy by the name of George, uh, oh, Lucas, George Lucas, yes. Mm -hmm. Francis, as most of you know, is the uh, five-time Oscar winner and many more nominations, writer-director of God, the Godfather Trilogy, Apocalypse Now, The Conversation, and many, many more. It's a great book filled with the kinds of stories I expect whenever I read one of Sam's tomes. You remind, rem might remember the last time Sammy and I talked together on this show was when I interviewed him for the best-selling book, The Big Goodbye, about the making of Chinatown. So let's get started. Sam, come on in, buddy. All right, I'm starting my video. Am I on? There you are. Oh my God, hi everyone. Hi, hi. Hawk. Hello, Sam, and, and welcome and thank you. Uh, as I said in the introduction, it really is a great book for anybody who's interested in, in Hollywood. And I think most of the people that watch this are. Uh, the detail. The detail is unbelievable all the way through. I mean, there is, and there's no way I'm ever going to get through all, everything. So I'm going to skip over stuff and maybe the people, if I don't talk about it, that means you got to read about that as well. So let's, st let's start with, was it your idea to write this book or did somebody come to you and how did the whole thing start? I had always wanted to write this book. It's one of the few books that I'd always wanted to write. The other one was a biography of Bob Fosse. And the other, and, and this, the reason I was uh, uh, interested in this subject, interest is too benign a word. The reason I was devoted to the subject was because having grown up in LA, my parents were friends with folks who were, had worked at Zoetrope Studios um, when it was at Las Palmas and um, Santa Monica. And Hollywood the work, General, yeah. Hollywood General and and the world that they described um, was unimaginably happy to me and um, not without its problems, but still a kind of creative paradise. And I thought, God, I miss the studio system. Um, I even missed the 70s. Um, and uh, but this seemed the last time Hollywood really worked. And I had been fascinated with what happened. Why did it go wrong? Could it come back? Does Francis have the right idea for the studio of the future? Even though it didn't succeed, is there a way we can retool this uh, idea or try it again now and, and, and bring us back to a sustainable, creative, financially solvent um, studio system? Well, I don't know if it'll be called the studio system, but I happen to know that I think there are people trying to do exactly what you're what you're talking about, and I hope it succeeds. Uh, what what was what was the title? Because you mentioned paradise. Why did you? Why was the title a path to paradise? It, well, I I borrow from Dante the epigraph: the path to paradise begins in hell, and that's um, I, I I think a very hopeful message that for all of the suffering that we do suffering actually is instructive and points us in the right direction so all of the suffering we've done in hollywood um and are doing in hollywood um is going to take us it is going to teach us um 
And in the same way it works, it works the same way for artists, that all of the suffering that artists do on a personal psychological level, and maybe not just artists, maybe everyone, um, that that is actually as painful as it is an engine to do something creative um, and, and in, in its way take us to paradise. Well, maybe you can then explain what Francis's dream was and what this idea of, you know, um, heaven yeah. and making movies, what, yeah. what was or still maybe still is his idea of how to make movies? Well, Francis's idea, which I think is brilliant, is that a Utopia is a movie studio. It's that simple. Um, it, it is a way that creative, intelligent, um, ambitious people of all kinds, of all kinds, can come together to, to, to work um, and in a way live. Um, and, and Zoetrope was his attempt to recreate that utopia, to test that concept. And all the work that I've done on the actual studio system from 27 to, you know, what do we call it, 48 maybe, points to that same understanding that you get in a studio when it's functioning flexibility, family, and fun. And um, I don't think there's a better definition of, of utopia. So um, I think the, the world, my world depends on it. And maybe our world too. Me too. Let me turn off this phone, which is ringing. Okay. Okay. As you can see, folks. It's live. I'm back. <laughs> I'm back. Sorry, you. guys. I forgot to turn that off. Hi, Jennifer. Sorry. That's all right. I'm always here to jump in in case there's dead space because Hawk and I love chatting. There you go. It's the and wonderful Jen Clymer, our director, producer, Miss Everything. Um, I do want to say for those of you in Los Angeles that don't find a lot of time to actually get your nose in a book, the audiobook is available on Audible, and that's I'm just starting it now. So, did you do the Audible? Sam, no, I do? I didn't do it. I didn't do it. No, you didn't invite me to do it. I I don't know. I, okay. You Hawk, you have the voice. You could have done it. And uh, you know what? It's all right. It's all right. You do have the voice. Well, let's get let's get back to the book. How did you, when when and how did you approach Francis uh, and his family about writing it? I approached Francis seven years ago. Um, the first time I decided when I first started writing the book seriously, and Francis said, "I don't want. I've done this already. I've 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 done enough interviews in my lifetime." I don't need to do this again. Um, and um, I said, Francis, this is not a book that's been written. You haven't done this one. You've done your biography, but you haven't done Zoetrope. He said, no, I'm not done. So I put the project aside and I wrote the book about Chinatown. Then after Chinatown, I thought, you know what? I want to tell this story so bad. I'm going to do it whether I get Francis or not. And I started doing it. And through a friend reconnected with Francis and Francis said, um, OK, I've, I've heard good things about you. Um, uh, we have the same friends in common. Uh, whatever you need is yours. Had he read Big Goodbye or some, any of your other books? I don't know what he's read. I'm assuming he must have checked me out to give me the, the thumbs up. Right. But well, I don't and, know what and, he read. Did you have to talk to, uh, did you talk to Ellie as well? Because I spoke I to mean, Ellie, I, I, Eleanor Copel, I spoke to the whole Roman, family, so Roman, uh, Sophia. Um, it's, it's, it's very much um, a, a story about marriage and show business. And, and I find that I keep coming back to that theme um, uh, in the big goodbye and the book about Fosse. Um, um, in my book about Audrey Hepburn, um, and and I really wanted to look at why, how this, let's see, 50-year-long marriage between Francis and Eleanor 
survived. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I, um, I, you know, gr growing up, growing up in LA, I saw a lot of families split apart by location, photography, and um, I, I tried to understand what that's about. And um, you know, the the wives. In many cases, it was wives going on set and sitting around and trying to be supportive of their husbands and getting angry and when is it my turn? And but of course, I support you as an artist. And this thing that I didn't see the end to and and kind of feared for myself as someone who was going to get married at some point, maybe even to someone in the movie business. Um, and um, that combined with the fact that in the studio era, you know, everyone came home for dinner um, really makes this a book not just about work, but about life. And um, I, 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 I mean, men and men are men and women are women. But in the studio era, families, there was there was more infrastructure for families. So um, I wanted to incorporate the Coppola family really becomes a part of this. Um, right. Well, uh, just, go ahead. Yeah. just so you know, that's all right. B Bob Beecher, the CEO of MPTF, has joined us because, as I'm sure you know, Bob worked for Zoetrope at one point. And, Bob, do you have a question? Is that why you're uh, oh, no, I, sticking I was your nose say, in here? Yeah, no, I was going to say, Sam, that, you know, back in the mid-'90s, I guess it was, when Eleanor's documentary hearts of darkness was uh produced francis i mean that was sort of a tough time for the two of them in terms of the revelations and the all that stuff from that documentary so i'm sure francis was a little allergic to the story as a result of that as well yeah or Probably, probably. Yeah. Um, uh, he he didn't he didn't say that uh, explicitly to me, but uh, it it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Um, one of the amazing things about interviewing Francis is that not just like that movie that Eleanor shot, nothing is off the table. He wants the record to be true. His idea of true, obviously, but he's going <laughs> to do it. I mean, even even. Even to his own um, embarrassment, he would tell me things that um, were embarrassing to himself. Um, so I really, I don't think maybe Bob. Now that I say that, he was so he's so rocked by that memory. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Well, as, as you remember, as you remember, Sam, Bob Evans' famous line: "There's, there's that his truth, my truth." And then the truth. Right. You yeah. Know. And that's, I have to grapple with that every day. Yeah. Every yeah. day. Um, give us a little backstory. I know he wrote, you know, a bio, but tell us a little bit about his relationship with his dad and how he grew up, the polio, and kind of why he got to probably where, where he got. Well, Francis, and, and I found this to be true of a lot of artists, you know, Francis started out um, with a lot of self-loathing. And um, he he saw himself as, as the middle child, which he literally was. Um, his brother was the family favorite, intellectual and uh, great looking. I mean, like movie star, beautiful, um, his brother, August Coppola. Um, uh, Francis had a sense of himself as unattractive, you know, overweight, big lips, big ears. Um, um, his, his mother was very hard on him. His father was the narcissistic center of the family. Um, so, uh, Francis and then contracting polio at a, a, a young age, being in bed for a year, missing school, missing his friends, um, was very, uh, very committed, tragically, to this idea that he was no good. And that's, I, I, I always say, parents, if you want to make, if you want your kids to be artists, neglect them. Um, that, that's, <laughs> um, 
that's um, that's the, the the as Francis said, the oyster that grows the pearl. And the pearl is imagination. If only life were this, you know, if only. Um, it's what we do when we're when we're writing, when we're making writing a script. What if this happens? What if this? What if the 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 self-maligned child lives in a state of what if? And Francis had that for him. So what changed from this? I know the answer, but I'm saying I want you to talk about what changed from this guy who was alone and felt like an outcast and the ugly duckling. Was it at Hofstra? Was it before that? He he what was it? You know, the the deadline lines that now everybody uses. What lit his fuse? What film lit his fuse? He saw uh, 10 Days That Shook the World, Eisenstein, and that made him think seriously about film. But it was before that, when he was at, uh, when he was at Hofstra, he was a theater major. He was not a film student originally. And he found in the theater a sense of community and uh, a bohemian lifestyle that he felt he could be a part of. Um, and. Um, it was really about collaboration for Francis, and it always would be after that. Collaboration is the greatest feeling in the world. You know, it combines all the virtues of solitary creation with all the virtues of connectedness. So he, when he figured that out, he thought, this is the most important thing. I want to create a world of collaboration. And, and he did. He did, and, and for yeah. all of the all of the people in our industry that are watching this today, that that's we you have our your home family, and you have your your movie or your television family, and I just got the chills thinking about that's that's that other family, and and as as much as people you know always get up and say, well, it's a collaborative effort. It is not one director can ever make a movie by himself. Not one producer, writer, actor. It's it's all of us. And Francis lived by that, Hawk. He lived by that. I mean, I have stories of he lived by that to a fault. Um, be, I have stories of Lucy Fisher, who was the head of Zoetrope Studios when she was just a kid, you know, I think she was 35. She <laughs> had never run a studio, and Francis said, You Lucy, if you're listening, you're still a kid. Yeah. <laughs> uh um. And Francis, Lucy would tell me these stories that Francis would ask the janitors for notes <laughs> and, and, and would mean it and would mean it. And he was so collaborative that it actually slowed down the machine. Um, but um, it wasn't about the product for Francis. Like I said, it was about the mutual enjoyment. It was about the moment of talking to the janitor and bringing everyone together. You know, it's the Coppola family. That's what it's, that's what it's about. It's about family. And, and by the way, when I, I talk about how you go deep, I mean, I read in your book that Jim Morrison of the doors was a grip on he went to UCLA. He was a grip on one of Francis's student films. I mean, where did you find that? I don't, I, I, Francis, I don't remember the exact details, but I know that Jim Morrison was a friend of Francis's and he was a film student. He was a UCLA film student. Wow. That I great? mean, that's, that's the depth of this book. And I, again, I have to congratulate you. It's so much fun to read that kind of stuff and just imagine, you know, yeah. Can you put the dolly over here, uh, Jim? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um, all right. So he made these student films, and then how did he? How did he get to make "You're a Big Boy Now"? Um, he did it himself. Francis always did it himself. You know, he knew he mo he go. The studio's not going to make it. You know, the movie he wants to make. So he says, "I'll finance it." I'll get it together. And best of all, I don't care about the money. And, and this is such an important point. And people think, oh, that's easy for Francis to say, you know, he's, 
he's worth hundreds of millions. Uh, but no, Francis was not, not at that not, time. He wasn't exactly it, it, in those days. He wasn't worth anything, and he had um, two, and then find, and then ultimately three kids to support, and his wife. Um, but he never cared about the money. It's so pure for him, and so he says, "I'm going to make a movie. What's going to stop me? What's going to stop me?" Uh, so he goes and he does it, and lo and behold, it gets into can. And he's still at UCLA. He must be the only student, film student, to ever get into the Cannes Film Festival. In incredible. Um, and um, uh, from there, you know, he got a lot of national press. He won uh, a writing award um, and uh, got a job with Roger Corman, you know, doing everything for Corman. Um, and... Um, and he got, he got a job for Ray Stark because got a job I, for Ray Stark, right? I was a second assistant director on This Property is Condemned, and Francis wrote a draft. That's right. That's right. Um, but I guess a, a way to organize what I'm saying is that Francis is a great producer, a great producer. And we think about Francis as a director for good reason. But this book is more about Francis the producer. What uh, so he, he gets all these accolades? Why in the hell did he decide to do Finian's Rainbow? Because it's a great question. Because his father was a musician um, and a composer, and Francis grew up and still has a big love of the old shows, and he loved the score to Finian's Rainbow. He loved the score. And um, uh, he couldn't he couldn't resist. Plus Fred Astaire. I mean. My God. So um, he does it and has a terrible time. Um, uh, but he did. But he did. He met George Lucas on that. Right. Correct. correct. Um, they they George and Francis met on the set of Finian's Rainbow because George had won a Warner Brothers scholarship. <clears throat> and um, this was really a low point at Warner Brothers. Not a lot was going on around the lot. And here are these uh, two guys, the only guys with beards as they like to joke. Um, so this is what, 1966, 67? Um, and um, <clears throat> uh, they connected, they found each other. And and they said, wait a second, this is not how we want to be making movies. Warner Brothers is not what it was. Um, and they they said, well, let's, let's hit the road. Let's do it on our own. And that's how Francis started making The Rain People. And I was going to say, again, yeah. One was a, you're a big boy now, now you're a big girl now. You're a big girl now, which is what the rain people is about. And Francis's movies are about growing up. I, I, I found, um, and, um, in, in fact, if you go chronologically through his career, you pretty much see the development of both of from you're a big boy now to, you know, you're, you're Don Corleone now, um, and um, with with some some returns to childhood along the way. Well, what didn't was was graffiti his idea or Lucas's idea or the two of theirs idea? Where did that come from? Well, <clears throat> um, Francis during the making of the Rain People, George started writing THX one one three eight, which he would then go on to make for Zoetrope. Um, but Francis said to him, you know, why don't you make something fun and human and warm? Um, which is a note that George took beautifully with, um, with American Graffiti, I, his best movie. I wish Lucas had taken it for the rest of his career. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, that would have, cha would have changed our business. <laughs> we might not be sitting here. Um, right. Uh, um, yeah, what what the what the world would have been if George Lucas continued to make what, what the, personal tender movies? Um, yeah. Um, wow. But yeah. Well, maybe was, in George's mind, uh, Star Wars is a personal tender. There are tender moments. There are boy, man, they they're few and far between. But yeah, they are there. It's not without. It's not without his touching moments. Right. Um, so let me ask you. 
Why, why did Francis call it American zoetrope? Um, he, because uh, zoetrope, which is a primitive filmmaking technology, you all remember the zoetrope. If you spin it around, you can look through the slat and see a horse jumping. Um, zoetrope means life movement or life revolution um, in Greek. Um, and um, he wanted this to be a life revolution, not just a way of making movies, but as I've talked about, um, a way of a new way of living, a new way of, of, of being together. So he put the, he called it zoetrope. He had enough money and he he did he buy a building or, or a floor of a building up in San Francisco? And that was the original zoetrope, right? The Take original us through zoetrope, kind right. of that that area. Yeah, the original zoetrope was up in San Francisco uh, in 1969. So that tells you. That tells you culturally and emotionally what's on Francis's mind. It's part of revolution to be in San Francisco in the end of the 60s. Um, he bought a place uh, on Folsom Street, a, a warehouse, and um, opened, opened the door and um, said, anyone want to make movies? And he would take in people off the street, unsolicited scripts, um, and um have have Thursday night Chinese food and, and a movie um, had bought a beautiful espresso machine where P and a pool table where people could come and hang out. I mean, this is not the Thalberg building. In other words, you know, this is like, this is the clubhouse um, and, you know, uh, uh, um, drugs and, and, and money. Um, this was bankrolled by John Kelly at Warner's. Um, Right after Easy Rider, Callie said, "All right, we'll we'll give you a we'll give you a few bucks and and let's see what what scripts you can come up with." And and one of the scripts I said was THX. One was the conversation. Um, one was um, um, Apocalypse Now. Milius had had written. Was Milius the first one to write Apocalypse? Milius was working on Apocalypse with Lucas. Um, let's see, Carol Ballard was working on a script that never got made. Um, Deschanel was up there, uh, Matthew Robbins and Hal Barwood. Right. Willard and Willard Hike, and Gloria. Gloria, Katz. Gloria yep. Katz, Katz, right. Um, Walter Murch. I mean, God, talk about burying. Yeah, let, just stop for a minute yeah. and explain if people don't know. I mean, the genius of Walter Murch. Well, yeah, Walter Walter Murch is an unbelievable, uh, imaginative, conceptual force, and um, and so in trope they realized the cheapest way to be creative was sound. Sound is not expensive, um, and that gave Walter um, true free reign to think not literally about movie sound it's it's not shoot the gun hear the bullet um maybe maybe it's not an actual bullet sound maybe it's an amplified bullet sound maybe you don't hear the bullet sound you know let's think about this abstractly um and of course you get out of that kind of thinking you get the soundscape of thx and the soundscape of Apocalypse. And of course, the famous example is um, in Godfather, after he shoots McCluskey, um, the, 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 the push in to Pacino and the sound of the screeching L train um, behind him. Um, there's no L train in the shot. That's a purely sound idea that serves no um, story function except emotion. Um, and that's the way Walter would think about sound. So, so I don't know this. If, what t again? Cameras had had new cameras had come in, new ways to shoot had come in, but it wasn't until THX that actually sound didn't just come from some speaker behind the screen. And was was that Walter and George together? Was it George's idea? It was the two of them together. They wanted to use music like sound effects and sound effects like music. 
and and what that means is that uh, whenever you heard music in the movie, it would be coming from a on-screen source, you know, a radio or something. Right. Um, and instead of score, it would be a weird soup of sounds that weren't quite musical. Um, that's an experimental approach in, uh, to, to sound that um, Zoetrope really, really pioneered now. And we take for granted. Also, also, Walter Murch was mixing sound the way they were mixing music using, a, you know, I don't, a, I'm, a lot of this isn't firm in my mind, but like six track audio Walter was doing. And that was new in the movie business. Um, um, you know, all those tracks. Bob, did you have another uh, thought? You're muted, Bob. You're muted. Were you asking about THX, the theater's sound system, or THX? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, the sound the sound oh. system didn't come until the like mid '80s, and that was uh, oh, no. right after Star Wars. No, right. it, THX was invented by a guy named Andy. Andy something or other at Lucasfilm Sprocket Systems in the 1980s. 80. Right, I'm talking about THX 1138, the movie. It's confusing. Yeah, that's what I was asking. Yeah, yeah. Where the, he meant the speaker system. No, no, I, I, th I thought it was, I thought it was the system. But yes, you're talking about THX 11. Uh, yeah. Five. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Thank and, you, Bob. Yeah. And kind way, of like a, you're kind of like a fact checker on CNN. No, no. But you were talking about Walter, if if uh, and the genius of Walter Murch, his book on editing. I think it's all called "On the Cutting Edge" or something like it's that. The blink of an eye. Blink of an eye is one of the great books about film editing that anyone could ever could ever read. It should be like a textbook for a film editing course. But of course, he, as Sam's saying, he got his start in sound and sound editing and creation. And then moved on to cutting picture as well. Right, he cut uh, Ghost for my father. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite films, and I like to watch it at least once a year, is Patton. Pat, yeah, Patton. Man, I mean, I, I loved war movies as a kid growing up, million dollar movie on. Channel Nine, you know, all the great John Ford, they were expendable, just, you know, all the great war movies. But when I saw Patton and that opening, I, I just was, do you know whether that was in Francis's script, that opening? Yes. Francis wrote that. Man. Francis I wrote mean, that. I, when you talk about openings of films, that's the, you know, what's the greatest opening of a film? You just think about that that American flag and and George C. Scott in front of it as a that little thing with the size of the flag, man. You're right, Hawk. It really is one of the great openings. I never thought about great openings, but it, it would have to be on that list. And oh, Frank, yeah. of course, so, won the Oscar, which he shared uh, for for Pat and screenplay, uh, which he shared with Edmund North. Edmund North, writer. yeah. yeah. Well, now, right. had North written this at first, or did Francis come in and do a rewrite? Do you know how that happened? You know, I don't remember. I think most of it was Francis. I, I, I think most of it was Francis. I don't I don't remember. Um, and it had gone through many drafts. Um, Francis wrote it originally, I think, for Lancaster. And then Lancaster didn't like it and didn't like Francis's draft. So they started doing rewrites. Lancaster fell off the project and George Scott came on the project. And I think it was George C. Scott who, in looking over the drafts, or uh, suggested a return to Francis. Well, I mean, what? If you want to see a great war film and you haven't seen it recently, run it, boy. And a great yeah. performance by George C. Scott. How about that one? And excuse me, that one of my dear friends, one of the best scores ever, Jerry Goldsmith. 
Oh man, yeah. He, really I the minute I say Patton, I hear that score. I don't know how he was nominated seventeen times and only won once. He didn't win for Chinatown. That's crazy. He didn't Who win for Patton. He won for the Omen. I mean, what a what a score. What a yeah. score. Um, now we I guess we should probably talk about a small little film called The Godfather. Oh yeah, The Godfather. I remember yeah. that. Let's let's yeah. start let's start from what's the true story now? I Mr. Bart, who's an old friend of mine, Peter Bart, has always said he went to Francis a couple of times. And you kind of in the book kind of take it take us through how Francis got involved. Yeah, well, it, it's 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 not anything like the movie The Offer that they shot. Uh, yes, I know. Unfortunately released. Um, it's nothing like that. Um, um, it was Peter Bart who said, um, you know, let's get this guy. He's in, you know, he's in trouble. We can, we can control him. He's a director on his knees. Um, uh, Evans liked the fact that he was an Italian because Evans would always say, I want to smell the, the tomato sauce. Um, uh, uh, there had just been a bad mob movie with Kirk Douglas as the Italian. So Evans was reacting called the Brotherhood, I think. And yeah. Evans, Evans very wisely said, we got to feel Italian. So, um, and a lot of directors had passed. Kazan had passed. Um, I can't remember who else had passed. Um, and uh, Coppola had passed, actually. Coppola read the book and he said, this is a stupid book. Um, and in for those of you who have read The Godfather, it is kind of stupid. It's a soap opera. Um, um, but it was George Lucas who said to Francis, Francis, we need the money. And I love that because it 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 tells you that it's about zoetrope. Um, Francis needed the money to save zoetrope. Um, and that's why he took the Godfather. It's, um, it's so funny. It reminds me, you know, my partner for a long time at the Producers Guild was Mark Gordon. And Mark Gordon, we'd, we'd always try and figure out how to how to get more money for the guild. And it, Mark would always say, because we need the eggs. This is what we're going to have to do. And that's what that's what Lucas said to him. We need the eggs. We need the yeah. money. Yeah. 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 And, and so, so, he did. so now he went and he met with Puzo. Yes. And, and Puzo and Francis was a love story from day one. They got on like a house on fire. Puzo, Puzo was not precious about the book. Um, he was open to making it better, and th they uh, they really l loved each other, um, Puzo and, and Francis. Um, now, I understand Paramount wanted a whole different cast than what, what right. ended up happening and what Francis wanted. So they, well, they were bucking heads right from the get-go. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to look back and say, how could it be anyone other than Pacino, you know, because we have the movie. Um, but back then, Pacino had only done Panic in Needle Park, I think. Um, and he was a scrawny, pale-looking guy, you know. Um, he he was no Ryan O'Neill, you know. He he was no movie star. Um, um, and um, Evans, Evans didn't want him. Um, and, you know, rather than say Evans was wrong, Francis was right, you know, these are such tough decisions. Um, but finally, Francis did get him, which says a lot for Evans. And, and, and we know that Evans and Francis fought all the way through. And Evans was not always well behaved. Um, um, but look, look what happened. You know, and Francis um, wasn't always well behaved. And Francis wasn't always well behaved. That's exactly right. So how, uh, how did they how did Brando decide to become you know, Brando and this this character. I think the story was he and Francis had a were having a meeting at Brando's house, and Brando just took two cotton balls in the meeting and put them in his mouth, or two celery sticks, or 
whatever two things and put them in his mouth and just started and just started doing it. Now, I was friends with uh, Gordon Willis, and I know that there were fighting between the two of them. And I don't know of a more beautiful films than Godfathers one and two from Gordy, the uh, as they used to call him, the Prince of Darkness. Uh, and I don't know if Ruddy was on on the set or not on the set, but um, no. there I, I love the story about how everybody wanted to fire Francis, and then something happened away from the studio that that changed it, and they couldn't do anything because now now it was Francis's movie. I'm talking about the the Oscar that he wins for Patton. Oh, yes. Uh, Fran kind of explain is, what. So in the middle of shooting Godfather and it not going well for Francis and really feeling that the studio was against him, which it was, um, uh, he wins the Oscar for, for Patton and becomes a genius overnight. I mean, at least that's how the movie business sees him. Um, and so for a while. he's for a while and and he starts to take on new authority, new confidence, new conviction and um, becomes like a Don, uh, becomes like Michael and really use those emotions in the filming of, of The Godfather and the handling of the studio. And can you talk about I love the story of the cut that Francis made because Evans said it was too long. Oh my God. Did Evans, you have to remind me of this. Did, oh. did <clears throat> what happened? Excuse me. Francis Evans was it's too long. It's too long. You got to cut two hours and 45 minutes too long. So Francis cut the heart out of the movie. Very smart. And showed it to them. And there was, they had no choice but to go back and put it the way Francis wanted it. See, well, this By is what way, I mean about Francis being the uh, the producer as well as the director. Yes, you know, yes. He, Francis was really thinking moves ahead. How are we going to get this thing across the finish line? How am I going to protect my own vision of this thing? Um, and stuff like that. I mean, that's not a director's intelligence, you know, at work there. Right. Well, and then The Godfather comes out. And by the way, I happen to be lucky enough and I don't know why, but I was invited to the premiere at the Village Theater in Westwood, which I'm sure all of you have read a whole bunch of uh, top directors and filmmakers have just bought the Village Theater. Did you see that, uh, Sam? Yeah, I saw that. I yeah. saw that. So uh, it was at the Village Theater. And all of us came out for standing ovation afterwards. And oh my God, th that movie, I think, changed Hollywood. It just really was, man, you can make a movie like that. And not only that, but because of it, I think that, that Francis got to, and George got to make graffiti because at that moment, I think Francis could do no wrong. Right. Was that... Uh, was that Ned Tannen? Was that over at Universal? Yes, yes that was Ned Tannen, who um, um, wanted them to cut all the music. <laughs> you know, it's one of these, it, he wanted them to cut all the music. But Ned Tannen deserves a lot of credit. I mean, he, he made, he, 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 he did his job. He made a lot of right decisions over there, Ned Tannen. And, and unfortunately, he did not see what he had with American graffiti, but um, they they don't always, you know. It's if no one knows what the future brings, um, and and a lot of what looks strange today um, is actually uh, what what we'll come to love in the future. Um, and I I don't know this because I never read the book, and this question just came to me. The original movie, The Godfather, was that the whole book, and and he and Francis created what happens in Godfather Two, or was that part of the book? Pretty much, Godfather Two is original. 
Um, if I if I remember, I haven't read the book in a while. Yeah, um, I would uh, think so. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, and, yeah. and he was able to, because of Godfather, he was able to make a movie that he was always interested in, which was The Conversation. Right. Which I assume right. Walter Murch must have had a lot to do with all the sound in that movie. That's right. And well, it was also Walter's first film as an editor. Right. The picture editor, not a sound, right. it was a picture editor. Right. Um, and then Francis, uh, but the, the reason uh, uh, Francis did Conversation was because it was part of his deal that he would then do Godfather 2. Um, so he only held it over them. I get to make Conversation yes. so that you get to have Godfather 2. Yes. And um, 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 it, it, it's important that people remember that Godfather 1 and Godfather 2, Francis were both jobs for Francis. Right. The, the main line of his career are these zoetrope movies. Later on. Later on and before. Right. Um, you, you know, um, The Rain People, for instance. You know, right. this is a real Francis zoetrope movie. And then and then Apocalypse, which he makes after. Right. We're going to uh, get to that in a minute. But I just, I want to read something that you wrote. And just remembering that Godfather 2 was nominated for 11 Oscars. Francis won three of them. <laughs> Directing, picture, and, and, uh, and writing. And there's something, this is, this is what drives me crazy about Hollywood. All right, this is just a little short piece that, that Sam wrote. Francis knew what he was doing, five Oscars. He had won them, hadn't he? In 71, Best Original Screenplay, Patton. 73, Best Adapted Screenplay, The Godfather. 75, Adapted Screenplay, Director, Picture, Godfather 2. He was a king, the most powerful, most respected writer, producer, director in Hollywood. And with all the attention and media resources conferred on him among the most impactful communicators on the planet. That year, one critic wrote, that Coppola's influence over people's minds is much more profound than any American politicians today. Imagine what he could do with all that influence. And yet he still couldn't get Paramount to finance Apocalypse Now. Five Oscars and the greatest filming streak in memory, and they wouldn't make his movie, which is, people always come to me and say, oh, if you get this director, you're going to make the movie because he just won the Oscar. And they go, no, uh-uh, doesn't happen. Unbelievable to me. You put your finger, that's like the pulse of this book, that, that very moment. You know, what kind of a business is this when Francis Ford Coppola, after this incredible streak of critical and, and commercial success, can't, can't get his movie made? What kind of business is this? And, exactly. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, you want a safe bet? That's as safe a bet as you could possibly make. But it's not safe enough? What are you waiting for? Uh, Come on, Bob. And, well, I was, I, I'm just curious to ask both of you, how much of that do you think is related to the subject matter of Apocalypse? Yeah. Yes. Not more was but still... It does, Bob, it doesn't matter. Well, believe me, when he made The Godfather, people were going, you know, oh... Another crime story, another crime yeah, family. I don't and think it's like when you when they turn down yeah. when they turn down Rocky. I won't mention the name of the studio executive. Oh, nobody wants to see a fight picture, right? You know, yeah. I mean, the Vietnam War was still highly divisive, and that was really the first. Yeah, but 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 Deer Hunter two yeah. years later wins the best picture. Oh, two years later, yeah. Well, but I'm I'm yeah. still saying yeah. it. It wasn't like Apocalypse was going to start shooting the next week. I, I disagree with your premise. Yeah, okay. Yeah, just Sam, kidding. what do you think? Well, Beecher is taking the studio's position. That's what they did say. They 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 did say, uh, you know, this the subject is too hot. Too hot. Um, uh, but look, they they also took on other controversial subjects. So, you know, executives will say whatever they want to say, to justify their no, um, 
Um, you know, maybe if Fr if Francis had signed Nicholson, you know, the studio might have jumped aboard. Or if he had signed Pacino, you know, or McQueen, yeah, you know, maybe the studio would have got. Maybe that's what they were really saying. Yeah. Um, well, um, but the next year, you know, uh, they made Network. I mean, talk about controversy. Right. 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 Um, Betty Chayefsky's The Hospital in right. those same years. You know. Right. Yeah. But anyway, um, good argument. Good argument. I like Bob. Thank you. Yeah, okay. I'm leaving. <laughs> Come back soon. <laughs> uh, in the book, the way the book is structured, you kind of go back and forth. You you tell us a little bit about Apocalypse and then go to other areas of his life and then come back. Uh, so for for now, let's just go straight ahead and talk about Apocalypse for a while. Okay. Um, talk about the fact that, again, Paramount said no. I think just about everybody said no. Yeah. How, did, how did he eventually get it financed? Uh, uh, he and Barry Hirsch, lawyer, Barry Hirsch, um, went and sold foreign territories um, at Cannes. Before, they didn't do that very often in those days. That's old hat today. That's old hat today, but it had never been done on the scale of apocalypse uh, up till that point. I think they got eight million in foreign, seven or eight. Beecher's back. Here, what do you got, Bob? No, I was just curious, Sam, because there, there's a guy in Francis's life for many, many years who you don't mention a lot in the book or at all, Paul Rassam. Right. And, he, and he was yes. really the Paul Rassam and his partner, whose name I'm forgetting, were really the foreign sales guys working with Barry and Francis. Did you did you interview Paul at all? Or no, I I wish I would have. I got his name uh, only too late. Okay. Um, but yes, he was um, working with. I Bear, Barry told me about him. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. There. Uh, so okay. So so that's where they got the money. Now. So oh, half the did, money. So they got they got. Did they have a cast yet, or not? Had Brando said yes? You don't know. I don't. Remember, it's an important question. I don't remember. Um, okay. My question is, in those days, even though the Hollywood studios said no, would the foreign financing people, oh, it's Coppola. Yeah, I'll give you X amount of dollars. I don't remember. I wish I did because it's a very important question. All right. Well, um, I don't remember either. But talk about, I know he did go to McQueen. And what happened? How come McQueen didn't do it? McQueen didn't. Um, McQueen told him that he wanted to be uh, at home, didn't want to go on location. Francis later discovered that McQueen was ill um, and and didn't want to disclose that. Right. And um, and Martin Sheen was Harvey Keitel at that point. Um, Harvey Keitel was cast, um, but he couldn't get stars um he did get brando and it's important to remember when he did get brando um let's see i'm going to try to uh i don't know he knows the page to go i don't know i i i <laughs> <laughs> I do know the page. It's in the beginning of the book, but I couldn't read fast enough. Right. Okay. It's all right. Um, so once they got foreign, they they got another seven or eight domestic from um, UA. UA. And yeah. at that time, it was Trans America. Yeah. If it, it was either just about to be Trans America or was Trans America. Right. Um, and then my friend David Field was yes. the West Coast head of production. Uh, and uh, I guess I guess the guys were going, was, I guess Arthur Krim and Medavoy yes. and all those guys had left. Yes. Were they still there? They were still there. Medavoy, Plesko. Um, Plesko. Plesko, Marsha Nassiter. Right. Um, um, who else? Benjamin, right. Benjamin. Bill and Bernstein was uh, 
I, business yeah, affairs. I so. Arthur Cramp, yes. Right. Not yeah. yet Peter Bach. Um Stephen Bach. Stephen Bach, Stephen Bach. Not yet Stephen Bach. Right. Sorry, right. I can it's all right. We can do it together, Hawk. There you go. Yeah. There you go. So all right. So he finally gets it cast. Now they start shooting. Uh, I just typhoons, drugs, heart attacks, drugs, Brando, and the ending. So let's take let's start with let's start with heart attacks. What happened? Oh God. Well, Sheen had a heart attack. So they Sheen has a heart attack. They've only been shooting, what, a few weeks. They have to shut down. They have to shut down. I think it was longer than a few weeks, but they're still in the middle of it. They have to shut down. Right. Uh, Typhoons destroyed their, their locations. Right. Um, Francis has to mortgage his house for another loan. Um, can you believe it? He doesn't have an ending. Brando is fat and doesn't know his lines. Um, and is costing a million a week, a million a week in 1976, seven. Um, and let's see, God, endless. Um, Just, it, it, I know because I got a call in 1976. Right. Uh, I got a call, you know, would I, would I come over and be the AD? And I, I told Francis that, that honestly, my life was in ruins. My wife and I were getting divorced. I had two little kids and I couldn't go. And I suggested Jerry Zeismer, who ended up becoming the first AD. Oh, here he is again. Oh, I, I was going to say, Hawk, your life was in ruins and everything. It sounds like you would have been the perfect AD for that film. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Probably, talking, but it's join, yeah. join the tattered, crippled and crazies down there. <laughs> yes. But and and everybody was on drugs over there. Right. Right. That was. Yeah, there's a great scene in uh, Ellie's documentary with Francis on the phone with Barry Hirsch about Marty Sheen. It's like, you know, tell them he's, you know, healthy. You know, he didn't have a heart attack, you know, just yeah. great. Yeah. 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 And Francis was doing that not because he wanted Sheen to, wanted to destroy Sheen, you know, wanted to ignore his health, but right. for the insurance. Yeah. 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 Hey, by the way, Bob, I think that would be a good idea to run uh, Ellie's documentary at the home. Yeah, I mean, it's an amazing... Uh, yeah, we're talking about it a lot. And that would be, that may be fun. I'd like to come. Maybe Sam would come. Oh, yeah. of course. What a great, what a great idea. Huh? Can we do that? Sure. Yes. I we could invite... Totally I could, set that up. Yeah, I could invite another great person to invite to that would be, I think you guys know him, Carrie Ann Tholis, who used to do... Uh, documentaries at HBO. Do you guys know him? No, I don't, but great. Yeah, he, he actually worked on the documentary with uh, George Zaloom and uh, his partner, Mayfield. Maybe Ellie would come. Uh, maybe Ellie would come, or maybe Ellie, if she couldn't come, she would Zoom. Yeah. yeah. Maybe yeah. she would Zoom. Yeah. All right, we'll try it out. All right, it's a good idea. All right, so now he's hocked, he's hocked everything. Right. He's in all kinds of trouble. Right. His his partner and Zoetrope has made this kind of little cartoony space movie. Right. And in the middle of all this, Star Wars is released. It becomes what we all know it became. And the headlines in the trades, Star Wars huge, you know, blah, 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 blah. And the other headline is. Coppola hawks all to finish Apocalypse. Yeah. And the the divergency exactly. of exactly. that whole thing. How did... Hawk, you're so smart. I mean, that's exactly the book. That's exactly, you know, you put your finger on the big beats and that's like Hollywood could now go this way or it could go this way. And we know which way it goes, you know? Um but Francis is going to hold on to the zoetrope way um, despite Star Wars. So really, this is a brother story, not literally, but but the the Hollywood that George creates is the Hollywood that Francis is trying to destroy. I yeah. just, 
really well, a reflection of the divergence of their two personalities. I mean, yes, Francis exactly. is a consummate gambler. Yeah, bet, but bet all the chips. And Fran, uh, George, you know, extremely conservative in that right. regard. Right. Uh, I'm sorry to do this, but Jennifer, can we just in the cut? I just want to remember that Sam Watson said I was smart. <laughs> it's all, I can't deny it. I can't deny it now. I can't take it back. It's already your ringtone. Thank you. <laughs> no, okay. Hawk, you put your finger on two of the big moments that only somebody who understands as you do business would see are, are crucial parts of the story. Yeah. Well, talk about the relationship between the two of them from that point forward. Can you expound a little bit on that? You know, two different, friendly from a distance. I mean, two different lives, two different approaches to Hollywood, not enemies, um, uh, but but to ha having gone two separate ways. And the, the best way to, to summarize the, the difference is that the Lucas and Lucas film approach emphasizes post-production and special effects uh and, and the francis zoetrope approach emphasizes pre-production um writing and rehearsal um and um experimentation we know which version won out yeah um yeah. Yeah. And 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 um not for the better. I I understand. I'm totally with you. Yeah. So he finally gets Apocalypse to be released. How did it go in the theaters and how did Francis finally feel about the film? I think Francis was proud but unresolved with the ending. Never really nailed the ending. Um, Did he and, want to do a different? I mean, I just watched it again. Because of reading your book, I watched the film again. What did you think? Again, I was left kind of eh at the end. Mm -hmm. It is. Because it's such a journey yes. to get there. Yes. And then what happens? I don't want to blow it for people who haven't seen it. But then it's just kind of going away. Yes. He never figured it out. But I guess my, my, I always thought, you know, it's the old adage, life is a journey. It's not once you get to where you're going that's exciting. It's the, it's the journey to get there. Well, one of Francis's Achilles heels is he gets caught up in philosophical questions. And philosophical questions don't always lend themselves to a beginning, middle, and end. Um, because most philosophical questions we're still wrestling with. Yeah. We haven't figured, we haven't figured this stuff out, you know? Yeah. So uh you you got to at a certain point go into an imagined conclusion with your with your story and let the philosophy go. And um, Francis was always reluctant to do that and was continually grappling with the evil in Kurtz and the evil in, in Willard and the good in Kurtz. How much evil is in us? How much good is in us? Is there good? Is there evil? He lost sight of what makes a good story. And that was as the director writer. Yes. As the producer I guess my next question is, when you say, and we all know, Francis now has hundreds of millions of dollars, probably not from the movie industry, although... No, from the wine, from the wine. From the wine. Yes. From the name. Yes. You know, yeah. but was he a good businessman, you think, or was he a bad businessman? Well, I think Francis... It's a great, it, it's the question, Hawk, it is the question. What, how do you define good? You know, is money good? Is that what makes a good businessman? Or is a good businessman somebody who enjoys his or her business? Well, for, yeah, for me. Right. 
from my definition is he got to do what he wanted and he loved right. doing it. Right. And, and he didn't make money in some areas, but he made money in some other areas. Being a good businessman isn't how many times you've been bankrupt. It's right. Yeah. Again, did you enjoy the journey? Right. You know, I'm, a, I'm not a very good, I'm a terrible businessman. It's yeah. Me too. But man, have I loved every minute of everything I've been able to do in my life. So I'm it's, not a good it's business. It's not about money. It's, you know, it's, no. it's, we, it's, it's just, and, and movies are so expensive, you know, movies have to be about money they that's the only way they can get made it's not like painting a painting you know it's not like doing a tap dance which costs nothing movies have to be about money but on the other hand on the other hand you cannot live your life because of money so but i i, I yes movies are about getting movies made or other movies made but Man, there are movies in the last few years that nobody went, you know, they didn't make any money and won yeah. the Oscar or won a million awards. Even, I mean, going all the way back, you know, there's a lot of movies that were not financially successful, but were That's great right. movies. That's right. You know, That's so right. I, 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 anyway, okay, good. Um, I asked you this before we went on the air a couple of weeks ago. It, before I've got some other stuff to talk about the studio and and one from the heart but is there a piece that you want to read is there anything in the book that you found that might be yes. interesting for them to hear yes I wanted to read um uh, a, a section of Francis's dream for the studio of the future for the what would be zoetrope studios at national general um and um this is one of the reasons I wrote the book, was to write this section. Um, he would build at least six parks around Zoetrope Studios. He would develop a training program for underrepresented Zoetrope employees of the future. He would rent out space with no overhead charge to producers. He would offer two acting tracks one for contracted actors in his repertory company, the other for freelance talent. He would do the same for writers and directors. Instead of giving out percentage points in individual films, he would give his contract players a share in the profits of the entire studio. Should they want to work elsewhere while under contract, he would, within reason, encourage them. For zoetrope workers and their families, he would enlist Hollywood professionals to lead free studio workshops in the art of filmmaking. He would open a zoetrope studio's restaurant, several restaurants, so employees and their families would eat, and for free. He would open a library. He would screen day and night favorite films. He would sign directors emeritus to serve as artists in residence. While at Zoetrope Studios, they would develop their own dream projects and act as ubiquitous mentors to Zoetrope artists. Zoetrope artists, in turn, would mentor high school students. Under the ages of August Coppola, his brother, the studio would become a living high school alternative for young artists like Gio Coppola, who struggled to learn the scholastic way. In addition, Coppola would develop Zoetrope Studios' nonprofit arm. He would open the lot to the greater community, like a museum or public park, and host film festivals, dance festivals, and drive-ins. He would lease the Pilot Light Theater on nearby Santa Monica Boulevard for zoetrope rehearsals and auditions by day and ticketed performances by night. He would expand to New York and develop a zoetrope theater division. They would hold an annual new play festival. The theater division would feed new talent to the film division, and the film division would feed seasoned talent to the theater division. He would collect them all by satellite. He would computerize the entire studio and to reserve the predictable, to reverse the predictable claims of waste and indulgence, make budgetary statistics available for all employed. He would oversee 15 modestly budgeted films a year. His name and reputation would earn him a healthy line of credit from Chase Manhattan. European and domestic distributors would provide the rest. He would devote a staggering 50% of Zoetrope's profits to research and development. He would have parties. He would keep his bungalow door open even while he worked. 
He would nurture a creative ecosystem that would keep everyone happily employed forever. No one would have to go to the jungle again. Wow. I want to be at that place. Maybe <laughs> up in heaven, they'll have the zoetrope will be there. And I, 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 I'm just making a reservation. That would be, yeah, that's, that's, that's the ultimate. That's the ultimate. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Thanks. Thanks for reading that. Um, let's get to where it started now. Now he's, he's made some money. <clears throat> he's lost a lot of money, but still he's going to find a way and he finds a real brick and mortar studio to buy. Mm -hmm. yeah. in general, uh, in Hollywood. And he puts it together. And right. He, he invites some directors who we're happy to have there and some directors who just kind of move in and don't leave. <laughs> He's got yeah. on, on the payroll, on yeah. the payroll, yeah. Michael Powell, John Luke Godard, John Luke Godard. <laughs> David Lynch, Gene Kelly. Gene Kelly. Starters. So let's. And the first movie he's going to make there is One from the Heart, right? He's going to make One from the Heart, an original musical. Um, by Army Bernstein. By Army Bernstein, who we love. Um, what a great guy. Love meeting Army Bernstein. You know, one of the fun things about what I do is I get to meet people. That's how I met Hawk. I interviewed him for the Chinatown book. And now Hawk and I are friends. And now Army and I are, are friends. Um, it's it's it's, uh, it's something I never hoped for when I started down the path of writing books. That wow, I could actually meet and love people doing this. So he starts with this small little musical, right? This small little musical, um, and it becomes a oh god, thirty four million dollar musical. I mean, it's it's apocalypse now on a soundstage. The apocalypse now on a soundstage, right? Um, and um, why? Tragically, why? Um, um, it's a big question. Um, once again, Hawk asking all the right questions. Um, he he wanted his idea for Zoetrope Studios was to make it sort of like Playhouse ninety, and shoot these movies like live television and that would get them out faster um and save a lot of money um and um um, um that's how he was going to shoot one from the heart long takes all going from one stage to another like rope like hitchcock's rope um and do it all on video um and this was the very beginning of video what happened was Storaro, his director of photography, who he loves for good reason, as we all do for good reason, Storaro said, Francis, it's not going to look good if we shoot 12, 12 minute takes. We're, we're never going to get this. This is going to look terrible. And Francis, being a collaborator and friend and man of community, above even art, I think. Um, says all right vittorio we'll do it your way and we'll do it in shots and um that slowed everything down um and um also um he lost francis lost the money early on this part was not his fault he lost an eight million dollar investment um um, for reasons that are hard to understand. So he was out of pocket week by week um, trying to keep this thing afloat right. for most of the for most of the movie. Um, at the same time, he's building the most beautiful set um, maybe that's ever been made in Hollywood. This recreation of Vegas. I saw it. I was there. What did you think, Hawk? It was amazing. I mean, I'm I'm a friend of Army's also, and I came on the set because Army invited me to see it. So yes, it was. It was. I didn't have to go to Vegas. I could just go to Zotrope Studios. Right, 
Right. Yeah. And the idea behind that extravagant set was was long takes. Uh, um, so uh, the, the, the press at the time misconstrued that as ego and indulgence. But really, that was a part of Francis's um, economic vision. All right. So let me ask a big question. You spent years researching this. You spent a lot of time with Francis and his family. Who is he? He's a guy that um, just wants to be a part of the group. Good answer. Good Fran answer. Just wants to sit down at the table and hang out. You In the book, you talk about two regrets that he has. Yeah. One, that one from the heart wasn't live cinema as he thought about what you just mentioned. But the other one is, it isn't mine alone, but my amazing generation, which didn't leave the cinema in better condition for the next generation. What do you think he means by that? And do you think he's right? I think he is right. And- um, What do you think it's their fault? No. <laughs> I don't think it's their fault. I think, I think America changed, and um, the corporate power um, that we still face today is, is very, you know, is very hard. It, it, it's very hard to fight the corporate power, and when it swallowed Hollywood, it swallowed Hollywood. Um, George Lucas is not a bad guy who sold out with uh, uh, Star Wars. And Spielberg is not a bad guy who sold out with Jaws. They made the movies they wanted to make. And Jaws is a great movie, you know. And he didn't make it for cynical reasons. Um, um, so, no, I, I don't blame these But guys. they, they, the studios and corporate America took those kinds of films and said... Why make in the heat of the night when we can make? Yeah, and and we can sell we can sell them anything. The movie doesn't have to be good. The marketing campaign has to be good. Um, you know, I think a lot of people took a lot of um, solace in the success of Barbie and Oppenheimer. The success of Barbie and Oppenheimer. I do not feel that way about these movies. I, I believe these movies were forced upon us. Um, these were not movies that we wanted to see. Uh, they were movies that we were made to see because we were screamed at you have to see these movies. So, but um, is, Sam, wait, hang on one second. But isn't that the way that at the coffee, at the coffee clutch on a Monday morning, years and years ago you had to go see whatever that movie is and we didn't have any of those you have to go see this movies until maybe top gun maverick or barbenheimer for a long long time because of covid and everything else i'm hoping that in the next iteration of whatever movies are coming out you know dune comes out friday is this right. a movie i'm hoping that everybody's going to say you've got to go see it if you're, right. if you're in the world, you have to go see it. So I'm mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt with that. No, no, you, 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 you. I want to make a, a subtler point that you help me clarify. What makes a movie? I have to go see it, and I, and I have to go see it. Movie, is it the movie? That would be good, or is it the marketing campaign? You know, that would be that would be bad. Um, uh, well, I'll just take an example of Ghost. Yes. They marketed Ghost. It did pretty well on a Friday night. Right. On Saturday night, I think it's still the highest jump from a Friday night to Saturday night. And that was well before social media. Word of mouth was, what a movie. Right. So right. that Different. happens too. It's not just the marketing campaign. Right. If it's a, if it's a great marketing campaign, but the movie's no good, it's still going to die after two weeks. Exactly. Right, right. Um, people have to be notified that the movie is coming out. Um, but are, what's the difference between 
the money spent on notifying them and the money spent on bludgeoning them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that makes the business lopsided. Mm -hmm. Why isn't that money on the screen? Why isn't that movie money going to another movie? We know what 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 how expensive marketing is. It's yeah. the tail wagging the dog. Yeah. Oh, got some ideas on that. We'll talk that another okay. time. That's a very now, important conversation. Right. Yeah. Now, for his whole life, Francis has wanted to make this movie Megalopolis. Right. He's he's made it. It's finished shooting. Right. That's right. He's in editing or it's done? I think it's done. Um, Do you have any idea? A, who financed it? B, who's releasing it? And C, when is it being released? The financing all came from Francis, from what I understand, 140 of his own million. And you got to love the guy. And um, the movie is about utopia. The movie is about these zoetrope ideas um so it is a culmination this picture um and um he says it's coming out this spring and i don't know anything about distribution okay my last question and then we'll, jen has a couple of questions what are you working on now is there another book or are you writing a screenplay or are you playing golf i mean what's next i i am doing frank capra uh, the biography of Frank Capra, which Hawk has right. Yep, I've yep. There he is. Where is it? Where is he? He's on the left, talking to Mazursky. Frank Capra, and that's and then, me. Yeah, and there's Mazursky, and Paul Mazursky, and John Fiedler, an executive at Columbia. Wow, I can't wait to read that one. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Well. Me as usual, Sam, it was a stimulating time talking oh, to you. Great, Thank great. you so much. I mean, it just, you know, I, you're you're one of the one of the people in Hollywood that we all have to. I'm so excited for everything you write and thank, thank you, you so much. Uh, now Jen does have a couple of questions. Jen, are you there? There she Hello. is. Thank you, Hawk. Hi, Jen. What did you think, Jen? Was it all right? It was great. I actually was drafting an email to you. The simplicity of the question, who is he? Well done. Blew me away. I'm going to, I'm just going to send that email right now to prove that I, there you go. Boom. Sent. Um, Sam, we've been down this road before. You know the two questions that I normally come in to ask. So I'm going to put a little spin on those two questions. We've heard your favorite movie and your favorite TV series. Let's hear what your favorite movie of the past 12 months has been and your favorite new TV series. My, I haven't watched television in many years. So I can't tell you what my favorite TV series is. But the movie I loved in the last 12 months was Past Lives. Beautiful film. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I, I have watched, um, I don't remember what answer I gave last time, but in case I didn't mention it, I love the series Friday Night Lights. You did mention that. Is that I'm the one I mentioned? Jason, I'm working with Jason Kadams right now on something. Oh, my God. That... That thing, that is a beautiful show. Yeah. 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 I'm excited because of Jason. God, I'm work. jealous. Can you tell, him, tell him I'm a fan. I will. Tell him I'm a fan. Sam, thank you. Everybody, I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been a, a great hour and a half, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll see you all soon. Take care. Great Quillers. Bye, Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Go get the book. Bye. Thank you. Bye.